All right. So today I am presentation uh, doing a presentation on karma. Um, I'm hoping that this will be maybe part one of two presentation because there is a lot to say on that topic. And today I decided to kind of focus on more, I guess, the uh, like the personal aspect of it, like the, the the personal focus on the kind of like karmic relationships, but also eventually in part two, I would like to expand on kind of like how does that affect our relationship with others maybe a little more. So today I'll focus on just one aspect of it. Um, so I'm really happy to be able to just be here and present once again uh, on a topic. Um, a, a bunch of a certain parts of my dissertation has been with translating a lot of stuff that has to do with karma. So a lot of the things that I'm going to talk about is about some of the stuff that I've learned in my dissertation, but also on different, you know, um, different texts that I've read, like on my own, the sutras that I've read too. Uh, but today I'm just going to put it into my own words, just try to really express it in my understanding of all the stuff that I've learned. So I guess as a disclaimer, I should say that, uh, what I'm going to say today, it might not be the vision that is shared by, you know, Monshin Sensei or the Junzan Tendai community. It's really my own understanding. And I'm just hoping that it's going to spur some really uh, kind of like thought provoking conversation and maybe some light bulb moments for some of you, like it did for me when I read about that stuff. So I'm going to dive right into it. So the first thing I'm going to do, this is just the structure of today. I'm going to talk a little bit about like the etymology of the word. So the different like a definition of what karma is. Then I'm going to focus a lot of the stuff I'm going to talk about today is going to have that connection with rebirth. Because as we know, like, you know, when we talk about karma, most of the time people automatically think about like rebirth is one of the first thing that comes to mind. So I want to clarify some of that today. Uh, and in connection with many different concepts that are key to Buddhist frameworks. And at the end, I would like to be able to maybe offer some advice as to how that can be useful to you, like in an everyday way of navigating life. And hopefully at the end, we'll have debunked some of the kind of like common understanding of, of karma and maybe shine some light on some confusions that might have arisen as you navigate your own Buddhist journey like I have been doing. So first up, etymology. Um, the thing to understand is that the root of the word Karma is in the sound kar, which means to do, to act, to make, etc. So the meaning is found in the root of the word, which is kar. If you add a suffix to that root, it's going to influence the different meanings that it has. So if you have kar and you have man, to makes it karman, it means action, deed, performance. So you see that the core of action is still there, but now it turns it into a noun rather than a verb. If you add karmin, it means acting, doing, working, but it's also the doer behind the action. So the person that's the actor is also referred to as karmin. So if we think about it that way, then the next question is then what about karma? So ma is a suffix that you add after a word that basically means pertaining to whatever the root is. So if you say karma, it's basically pertaining to kar. If you say dharma, it's pertaining to dar, right? So in this case, it's pertaining to act because karma means act. So it's not that it's wrong to say that karma means action or that karma means cause and effect. But if you really want to highlight the action itself, it's not karma, it's karman. If you talk about karma, it's just whatever relates to act. And that subtlety is actually very important because if you think about it that way, whatever relates to act is a lot of stuff, including the action, the cause, the effect, the time, the place, the heart behind the action, the environment it takes place. All of these, this network of thing is what is understood linguistically speaking with the term karma, because all of these things are what pertains to an act. So it's not wrong to say action is karma, but it's just one part of it. It's not wrong to say cause and effect is karma, but it's just one part of it. It's the totality of these connection that truly is meant linguistically with the term karma. So that's the first part. If we normally, the way that karma is kind of like put and understood, and it's in this kind of, I guess, like domino effect, right? 
of like there's a cause and an action and an effect that leads to a cause to an action and an effect and it's this kind of like domino snowballing effect of things that just keeps accumulating with time uh so here an example that i give just for the sake of this presentation is you might have feelings of hate you know that arise that leads to an action that would be for example hurtful and the effect would be suffering and that suffering transfers into a cause that is sadness that leads to an action of crying there's an effect of suffering etc and then you are the fortunate recipient of this beautiful chain of events that just landed on you so this is a kind of typical understanding uh, of karma which again is not necessarily wrong and it talks about the cause and effect it has the actions that are like part of this network of of things that happen but to understand this principle i guess correctly we have to talk about dependent co-origination so pratitya samutpada in sanskrit or engi in japanese basically what co-origination is is the idea that all phenomena originates from a cause and they're necessarily connected to an effect so nothing originates on its own whenever something originates which includes an action like a an action is considered a phenomena so whenever a being a phenomena an action etc whenever it happens whenever it it gets born into the world it gets born into this network of connection that we talked about earlier right? it's connected to the actor it's connected to what follows it what came before it uh, it's connected to the environment that it's in so all of this network that the action is dependent on is key to understanding what karma is and this is where the connection between birth takes place right because origination is birth is when a thing kind of arises originates get birth so birth in this context is not just the like the birth of a biological being like you know when we are born birth is actually part of every single step of the process in 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 the karma understanding so the birth of a cause gives birth to an action which gives birth to an effect which gives birth to a cause which gives birth to an action which gives birth to an effect etc 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 so birth is not just birth in terms of when you're born as a being is the birth of an action also is connected to all of these different births that it either generates or it's impacted by so birth in relation to karma is more than just the kind of you know again rebirth understanding of things it's every single step of the process is imbued with origination okay so this dependent co-origination framework um is necessary to understand emptiness and I'm going to connect emptiness with karma in a second so there's this quote from the uh, Vigraha Vyavartani from Nagarjuna uh, it's the verse 22 of this text that basically states that this dependent nature of thing is called emptiness so what we talked about right the fact that everything is connected it's dependent on multiple thing when it arises is what is meant by emptiness so dependent means that things do not have self-existence self-existence the Sanskrit word is swabahava and you have uh, jisho in in Japanese um is this idea that like thing exists on its own right like I can exist but I'm not connected to anything so therefore I'm never changing because in this network of things that we talked about earlier if I let's say go back here you have the action but then if the circumstance change then it's going to change the action if the place change is going to change the action so all this network means that things are, are if one thing of that that connection changes it changes the other things and that's what that's why things are impermanent because it only takes one thing to change for all of these other things to change so a thing that is permanent would means that is disconnected from everything and that within the framework of dependent co-origination is impossible you cannot have a thing that exists on its own without being connected to anything else which also includes dharmas and buddhas and all of that stuff and bodhisattvas you know bodhisattvas exist because suffering exists and we need them to help us guide us the teaching exists because we need them we need the teachings for it both to guide us so there's a relationship of dependency uh it doesn't exist on their own um so emptiness is really not emptiness to mean nothingness nothingness is a different term emptiness is things are empty of self-existence that is what is understood in within the concept of uh dependent co-origination so what that also means is in relation to karma and rebirth specifically is there is this 
uh, I guess, sometimes confusion when talking about karma that in rebirth, there's like this, the soul that like transfers from one plate, from one being to another being. And that's what we understand by, by rebirth. Um, so the soul or this kind of depend independent being that has self-existent that transfers over from one being to another is not a thing that exists in Buddhism debunks that, uh, the, the, the Atman theory with the theory of dependent co-origination. So what gets transferred then into the birth of another thing into like I'm born and then so normally what we would say would be something around the lines of, you know, like in my past life, I did some bad stuff and now I'm suffering the consequences. So that's the framework that is a bit problematic within this framework because there's no I that's being transferred from one to another. And the best way that I've ever heard anybody describe this actually comes from a psychiatrist in the US that is also has done a training to become a monk and eventually he didn't become a monk, but he has this, this knowledge. He also trained a lot in the yogic tradition. And the way he explained it was using like pool or beard as an example. So if you imagine that uh, there is ball number 13 at the picture quality is really bad. I think it's number 13. So just bear with me. Just stick with me. I was going to say it's 13. So there's ball number 13. And ball number 13 moves forward, carrying with itself a particular energy. And I don't mean energy necessarily in a kind of like, you know, spiritual way. Like I, I just, I'm trying to frame it in a way that makes it easily understandable. Uh, energy here could just be a kind of physic, you know, uh, thermodynamic kind of thing. So the ball carries with itself a particular energy. And then when it collides with number eight, it's like number 13 stops and then number eight moves forward. And when number eight moves forward, it carries with itself the energy of ball number 13. But the identity of ball number 13 doesn't transfer over to ball number eight. Ball number eight is just ball number eight. Ball number 13 is ball number 13. But the energy gets transferred over. And the moment of action is when there's a collision between the two, right? There's a collection. This is the action part, this interchange. During that interchange, the energy transferred from one to the other. And the only thing that remains after is not the identity. It's just the energy that was carried by ball number 13. So if you think about ball 13 in terms of your life, then you carry with yourself as you move forward, you carry, you know, things along the way with your life as you're going to move forward. And when there's going to be the moment that you stop, that energy is going to transfer somewhere else. And that energy is going to give birth to something else that's going to carry that energy with you. But but it's not your energy. It's not your identity as, you know, Munchin Sensei or as Jake or anything is not going to carry over. But obviously, if we think about everything we named earlier, that chain of events goes way farther than this, right? Because ball number 13 moved forward because it was first all first hit by the white ball, which was first hit by the stick, which was manipulated by the person that has a particular grounding on the floor, right? So the energy starts here, like it starts here, and then it kind of moves forward. Then this person is going to like, move this thing forward that's going to hit the white ball that's going to hit the ball 13 and so all of this energy it gets being transferred to a chain of event that reaches number eight but like the identity of the feet is completely gone when it reaches number eight but the energy still carries forward and it's allowing it to move like and continuing that so that is the the idea of birth the birth of you know particular events leads 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 and the energy gets transferred but with without the the self-existent soul or entity that gets transferred in the process another very easy way to understand it is if people that are kind of familiar with martial arts like if you focus on the punch you know the moment of the punch the punch is just a, the end result of a series of chain of events that started from someone that starts their energy with their feet you know, if you hit a tennis ball, it's the same thing. It starts with the feet and then your whole booty, uh, booty, well, body kind of like moves around and the ball mo eventually moves forward. So karma is not just the action, right? Karma is not just the action of the punch. It's everything that came before and everything that will happen after. It's all of these connections, including the connections of like where this person is, the time and all that kind of stuff. So it's really, really, really broad. So 
these are the, the things that I wanted to clarify about karma with regards to kind of like one's own person. Now, moving on into kind of like, how does it affect or how can it, I guess, change or affect in, a, in a daily life circumstances is that at the end of the day, within that framework, no being is responsible for their karmic inheritance because it's not you 10 lifetimes ago that did something, right? You just inherited, you're like, you inherited a particular chain of events. And so it's not your, whatever you inherited, whether it's good or bad for good or worse, it's not your fault, right? It's, it's not your responsibility, whatever you've inherited, but all of us are responsible for the karma we generate, for the karmic generation that we do. So you might have received the particular thing, but then you have a personal responsibility to react to the circumstances that are given to you with particular ways so that you can send a particular kind of energy forward. You can say, if there's a problematic energy that you've inherited, you can kind of like change it through purifying yourself and then send forward an energy of compassion that is going to lead to a ripple effect of good things instead of necessarily like suffering related things. So a good example of that, and I have to give credit to my wife on this because she's the one that taught to me about this, is the concept of intergenerational trauma. So if you have, you know, circumstances in your life, like highlighted in this image of someone that says, oh, you know, stupid, you're not good enough, and it's passing down intergenerationally, you're not responsible for the messages you've inherited, but you have a responsibility to stop these messages and give something different. And you have the capacity to do this. Every single person and being has the capacity to do this. Um, so karma comes with that sense of responsibility. You might not be responsible for what you've inherited, but you're responsible for what you generate in this world because it's going to carry your energy with it. That another kind of application, which is very similar, I'm just phrasing it in different word to try to make sense, is that karma leads to the manifestation of particular circumstances. So it's like the cause and effect means that particular circumstances are going to present themselves to you. And we are responsible for what we choose to do with them. So you might have circumstances that are coming your way that are not your fault, but you have the responsibility to choose how you want to engage with them. So do you choose to repeat the, the patterns that are transferred over in that energy you've inherited in the karmic inheritance you've received? There might be problematic habitual patterns that are in there. Do you repeat these patterns moving forward or do you change these patterns to generate something differently? So in a way, that's how one of the way I like to think about it. Again, it's, this is my, my own framing of what I understand is that like karma presents to you like a fork road. Like, and then there's a fork that is like the, the habitual responses that you always give. So do you choose to continue that energy forward or do you take the different direction? And every single time you take a different direction, then new circumstances are going to arise, right? As a result of cause and effect, new circumstances are going to arise. It's going to be another fork. And then you choose how you want to engage with it. So that kind of debunks the idea that like karma is like deterministic of like, it's like fate. It's determinist. You're, you're, you're determined to act in a particular way. And it's decided by, you know, karma. It's no karma just presents you with a set of circumstances, but you have the capacity and responsibility to choose however you want to engage with that process. And that requires a lot of mindfulness, a lot of awareness of yourself, of what you've inherited and all of that kind of stuff to be able to make different kinds of choices, choices, which the Buddhist teachings are there to help figure out how to have that kind of awareness and understanding of things. So what have I tried to debunk today with the kind of traditional understanding of, of karma? First of all, karma is not just an action but it's the totality of what encompasses act. Dependent coordination and rebirth. So karma extends far beyond the immediate cause that gives birth to an action and far beyond the immediate effect that is birthed by an action. It's actually the totality of the web of cause and effect that it's connected to. Secondly, there is no nature, essence, or soul that is transferred through karmic processes. A thing simply inherits the energy of past actions and will transfer this energy in, in their action 
if their action is not purified. So the purifying part is not something I'll engage with in this particular presentation. That would be for part two. But this is the idea behind it. And lastly, we are not responsible for our karmic inheritance, but we all of us are responsible for our karmic generation. So in a nutshell, this is what I've been wanting to debunk and talk about today with regards to karma. Uh, stay tuned for part two, hopefully. And uh, part two, these are the kind of stuff I'd like to engage with, like some of the stuff that's unique with karmic theory. So it's funny enough, karma is about action, but you also don't need an action for things to happen. So an actor for things to happen. So that's something that we'll talk about and it's unique to karmic theory. Uh, I've encountered stuff that talks about the three different types of karma the relationship between how do you purify yourself so that the energy you send forward is not necessarily the things that you've inherited from the past. And also, there is a scriptural response to the question that I think most of us have probably engaged with at least once in our, in our journey with Buddhism, is why is it that some people do bad action and receive good things, while some people do good action and receive bad things? So there is an explanation in, in, uh, in scriptures for that, and that's something that I would want to like present to you uh, maybe in the next presentation. So today I focused on part number one, which is just the personal kind of component. And part two is going to be about how do we go about engaging with that when we engage with others in our relationship with the world. So, so that is the presentation for today. And uh, I will leave the floor for maybe comments or questions on, on the topic. Let me just, I'll, I'll just why don't you uh, unmute people? Yeah, um, um, you're unmuted. Maxime, I just wanted to say that you didn't say anything that is not consistent with, you know, Orthodox Buddhism and certainly Tendai. So perfect. <laughs> your your understanding is 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 right on in that respect. Thank uh, you. I, I, I appreciate the validation. <laughs> and I, I I think you did a great presentation and presented it in a way that that's understandable. So good job. Thank you. Open it up to questions and answers. Oh, and I'll stop the recording as well. Yeah. Uh.